And of course, there are going to be exceptions. But understanding the spectrum is helpful, whoever you're teaching. Hello, and welcome to the Arts of Language podcast with Andrew Poudois, founder of the Institute for Excellence in Writing, or as many like to say, IEW. My name is Julie Walker, and I'm honored to serve Andrew and IEW as the Chief Marketing Officer. Our goal is to equip teachers and teaching parents with methods and materials which will aid them in training their students to become confident and competent communicators and thinkers. So, Andrew, as you know, and perhaps many of our listeners know, I have a couple grandchildren. Yes. One you, is a, you want to catch up with me someday. <laughs> no, I would love to catch up with you, but I don't think that's ever going to happen. First of all, your number of children outnumber mine significantly. Yeah. So how many grandchildren do you have now? Fifteen. Fifteen. Yes. Yeah. Well, I have two, <laughs> but I have a boy and a girl. Yes, you do. And they are cute. They're pretty darn cute, yes. And so my granddaughter is four years old, and my grandson is a year and a half. And my granddaughter is a bit precocious and definitely high energy. And my grandson is pretty mellow, and his sister does all of the talking for him. Well, he's only 18 months, so he doesn't do a lot of talking anyway. But even with that, Andrew, there are definitely differences between the girl, granddaughter, and the boy, even though you, we tend to think that boys are more active than girls, and then Lucy being super active would probably be even more active than Nolan. But that is not the case. This mellow boy still <laughs> does distinctively boy things, hmm. throwing objects where he often gets in trouble for <laughs> from his mother. And anyway, it's just it's just really fascinating that even in our culture of trying to make everything equal, there are differences between boys and girls. Well, yeah, it's kind of a difficult subject in some ways to yeah, talk about it because is. Um, certain forces in the world are trying to convince us all that there aren't biological, neurological, physiological differences. Right. But those of us who are parents, grandparents, teachers, actually, I think anyone who spends any length of time at all with children will realize that, indeed, the truth cannot be denied. Yes. And this is not just our own anecdotal experiences. This is empirical research that has demonstrated this over and over again. Sure, sure. There's so much in that area. And of course, I have been, you know, for many years sharing uh, the research that Dr. Leonard Sachs Mm -hmm. collected up a couple decades ago when he was writing his book, Why Gender Matters. Mm -hmm. And um, he's um, continued in that area to help people understand that there are these significant differences. There are other writers Mm -hmm. uh, who, you know, don't have a political or religious agenda per se. Right. But they are realizing that there are differences between boys and girls, males, females, men and women, and that we need to acknowledge this if we're going to serve everyone well. Mm -hmm. Yep. And, um, so, you know, I think it's a, a difficult subject. And, of course, there are always going to be accusations of generalizations. Mm-hmm. Not all boys are like that. Not all girls are like that. Right. Well, that's true. Right. But when you have, you know, a super majority of girls having different neurophysiology than the super majority of boys, it becomes a valid statistically valid generalization that can be useful. Right. Exactly. So you have a convention talk that you, uh, that's one of your most popular. It was, yeah. I've actually 
divided the talk into、mm-hmm. two parts. Right. The, the original talk was called "Teaching Boys and Other Children Who Would Rather Be Making Forts All Day." Right. And、uh, like a lot of my talks, it starts out and then I add content and it gets <laughs> bigger and it's harder to fit into an hour and it gets bloated and bloated to the point where it's not even reasonable to do it in an hour. And so then I I cut it in half. So、uh, the one I did last year was called "Teaching Boys and Teaching Girls Toward a Better Understanding,"、mm-hmm. and then I took the second half and changed that into the art and science of motivation. Right, and we did do a podcast on that, so we'll be sure and put a link in the show notes on the motivational part of that great talk. And this talk, this conversation that we're going to have. Is about the teaching boys and teaching girls, so right. So when I first listened to Dr. Sachs's presentation, it was、mm-hmm. a four-hour presentation. Wow, there was breaks in the middle, <laughs> but I was just wrapped. I was on the edge of my seat. I took I don't know, fifteen twenty pages of notes.、Mm. He is brilliant, an MD, PhD, extremely well educated. We've had him. On our、yes. podcast before, and he was bringing the science, the research, to support things that I kind of already had observed、mm-hmm. and known to be true in my experience, and it was delightful to discover the science that supports my experience of the truth,、mm-hmm. and so I started sharing those ideas with people about、mm-hmm. how. There are auditory boys and girls hear differently. They see differently. They handle stress and pain differently from a neurophysiological perspective, not emotional. Although there are emotional aspects,、mm-hmm. and he has, you know, written and taught about that. But I thought this is just so interesting. I have long suspected. That girls hear softer sounds than boys, and when he said, "Here's the research to show this," and it's not environmental, it starts at a very, very young age before any conditioning would even be possible. Right. Looking at at the way the cochlea vibrates to softer sounds,、mm-hmm. reinforced with、um, fMRI imaging. To show that in very young children, most females' brains respond to softer sounds than most males,、mm. and this this continues through life. Although as we get older, we tend to compensate for that、mm-hmm. a little bit. Now, I think most moms figure this out pretty quickly. In in fact, it's it's kind of funny because. I've talked to women who were shocked that it's possible that their husbands didn't actually hear what they <laughs> thought they were supposed to be hearing. You mean it wasn't just selective hearing? No, I mean I'm sure there's some of that, that goes on. <laughs> and so,、uh, you know, Sachs presented a whole lot of research and said, you know. You can improve student engagement with boys simply by speaking louder,、mm-hmm. and girls are more easily distracted by small sounds.、Mm. So he pointed out that you know if you can minimize auditory distraction, then you can actually create a better learning environment for girls.、Mm-hmm. And you know I have long kind of. Had this idea that it was easier for me, and entirely selfish, because you know I like a nice, easy life. <laughs> but that it was easier for me if I could kind of get the boys on one side of the room, and the girls on the other side、mm. of the room, and then I would stand over on the boys' side, talk as loud as I needed to, pound on the table if necessary, and they're all very tuned in, and the girls are over there. Perfectly safe. <laughs> and when he explained this, I thought, "Wow, I have been semi-consciously trying to do what he's saying、mm-hmm. uh, without even knowing why." So that was just very interesting. And、uh, you know, he had other 
kinds of research to show that, yes, indeed, these differences do persist through life. One, one that kind of cracks everyone up is this <clears throat> fact, uh, this, this study that showed that women listening to audiobooks are generally seeing – we're generally seeing neural activity equally in both hemispheres mm -hmm. of the cortex, whereas men listening to audiobooks, most of the neural activity is happening in the dominant hemisphere, the language executive function processing, and much less in the subdominant artistic intuitive side. And that confirms something that many women have long suspected, which is that most men are using half their brain most of the time. <laughs> But you know we're we're just we're wired differently, and you could look at it. I mean, you could make an evolutionary argument that women and men have had different tasks through most of the development of human brain function, mm -hmm. and that that carries over. You could also make an argument that we were created differently, and that. Motherhood requires a, a different set of neurological aptitudes mm. and things that men have traditionally had to do require a different set of neurological aptitudes. Now we see, of course, you know, those roles are less distinct in our modern society mm -hmm. and maybe our brains will gradually change and adapt. I don't know. But uh, I just found, you know, from working with kids, I've long known, talk louder and boys do better. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, you know, that was one area. Another area I found even more interesting from my perspective of a teacher of writing uh, was visual differences, although not in the way that most people would expect. Sachs noted that Research in mammals, not just humans, but all the way down to rodent level, mm -hmm. the optic nerve is connected to the retina differently. Hmm. And it has to do with the way that light information is processed. So most females have more P cells connected to the cones mm -hmm. in the retina. Mm -hmm. You remember biology, rods and cones mm -hmm. and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And most males have more M cells in the optic nerve connected to the rods. Now, the reason that is significant is because it's the rods in our retina that detect motion, direction, speed, and it's the cones that process information having to do with color and texture. Okay. So most men, most males, will process that information with speed and direction and movement more vibrantly or more powerfully. And most females will process information with color and texture mm. more vibrantly, more powerfully. And... This comes out behaviorally. One study he mentioned was with newborns. So again, it's you know, there's an argument to say, well, boys and girls are different because we treat them differently. Mm -hmm. But if you're dealing with newborns, there's really no, you know, environmental influence to shape that. Right. <clears throat> but uh, you know, babies in a crib with one side a spinning metallic mobile. And on the other side, uh, you know, a young woman with a pretty face, right? So two, two things. Impartial observers noting during the waking period where was that baby focusing attention. Oh, right. And they found that almost all the boys were looking at the spinning metallic mobile and almost all the girls were looking at the young woman's face. Hmm. Why? Well, because that's easier for them to see and newborns don't see all that much, all right. that well to begin with. So they're going to lock on to what is the better stimulus, the mm -hmm. more powerful stimulus. Sachs noted something again, and I had seen this. I taught preschool for a couple of years and spent a lot of time teaching 
music and working with young, very young children, three, four, five, six years old. And of course, I had, you know, I had <laughs> seven children, most of whom were very young. Um, and so he pointed out that very often you'll see boys of that younger age when they start to draw. They're trying to draw things that are moving, mm -hmm. right? Bullets coming out of a gun or arrows arcing across the sky or mm -hmm. explosions or car crashes. And girls tend to, to focus on things. So they'll draw flowers and rainbows and faces mm -hmm. and, and houses and, and things. Why? Well, it's just reflecting the way in which, you know, we see the world differently. Well, and, you know, I just anecdotally, I have evidence of that myself, you know, being a girl. I definitely grew up with coloring books and color crayons, and I just loved that 64 color box of crayons. <laughs> and so being the mom, I thought I would help my boys and introduce them to the world of coloring books and colors. And, you know, they wanted the blank paper and the dark crayon so they could draw. So we got rid of the coloring books. They mm -hmm. were not at all interested in coloring books. And now, fast forward to my granddaughter, who loves coloring books, loves coloring books, could spend hours with her. Yes, I just bought her, not crayons, but felt tip markers, fine point. Oh my goodness. She just loves, is so in, enamored by that. So, Well, and there's, there's research to show that the average woman has more words in her vocabulary for colors mm -hmm. than the average man. So th there's that tendency to differentiate color and the man's like, it's green. You know, why, why are you asking me which green is different? They're just both just green. And that We had a conversation last night over FaceTime about the difference between salmon and coral. Uh -huh. <laughs> salmon is something you eat and coral is something that you see if you're underwater. But they're not colors in my brain. However, you know, I can I can see that. What was really interesting to me about what Dr. Sachs was sharing is that this even comes out in the way that people use language. Mm -hmm. So this was a, a study he mentioned done with college students and creative writing. So these are adults. And what they found is that men's creative writing, the, the descriptor categories or what you might call keywords and sentences, but the the words that carried more weight in the sentence tended to be verbs and adverbs. Mm. And with women, the words that carried more of the weight tended to be nouns and adjectives. Mm -hmm. And I, I've noticed that y you can almost see an attitude change in the way you're talking to a child. If you say to a, a boy, hey, son, this is a pretty good story you've got going here, would you like me to help you add a little more detail? Or could you add a little more detail? Or worse, couldn't you add a little more detail? <laughs> right. Or even worse, why don't you add a little more detail? His response would probably be, at least mentally, if not also verbally, no. Mm. Isn't it good enough? Mm. Can I go play? Mm. Right? Because that, that add detail doesn't resonate with the way he perceives what he's doing or the world around. But if you just shift a little bit and say, hey, son, this is a pretty good story you've got going here. Would you like me to help you add in a little more action? His whole attitude be kind of mm -hmm. like, hmm. Cool. That might be cool. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, I guess. Okay. Right? Just, just the whole idea of it. Mm -hmm. And so if we can understand that about the children whom we're teaching them, we can teach them more appropriately. You know, mm -hmm. I have long noted that we have, I think, a record of particularly good success with reluctant writer boys. Yeah, it's I true. mean, if we, we do well with everybody, mm -hmm. but if we had the super sweet spot of transformative attitude, it would be that reluctant writer boy, mm -hmm. probably nine to twelve, that zone, right? Mm -hmm. 
And I think there are a lot of reasons for that, but one of them, I suspect, has to do with just the order of the dress-up techniques, mm, mm -hmm. right? So if you look at almost every book, every video, everything we do, first dress-up technique, L-Y adverb. Yep. Well, children in general, and boys in particular, are motion-based. Mm. So they can relate to the idea of a word that enhances or amplifies motion mm -hmm. or is likely to do so mm -hmm. better than they can relate to a word that doesn't. Right. And I have been challenged by school teachers. Why do you start with L-Y adverb? Why don't you start with adjective? Mm -hmm. That is grammatically simpler. Yeah. And I mean, objectively, it is. If you, if you take an adjective like happy, mm -hmm. And then you stick an L-Y on it, you get happily. Mm -hmm. So adjectives are the root of adverbs. And so for, for a lot of years, I said, well, I don't know. That's just the way I've always done it. But now I can explain because it's easier for children to use adverbs. So mm -hmm. it makes sense to make that the very first easiest because we like the easy mm -hmm. plus one mm -hmm. stylistic technique. Right. And right. It, it particularly benefits, I think, the boys. So, and I like how you say that you can stick an L-Y adverb pretty much anywhere in the sentence, whereas an adjective has to go in a particular right. place. Right. Yeah, adverbs are a lot more flexible mm -hmm. in, in where you can put them. That's great for all children, boy or girl, because they're not going to get it wrong. Right. It's, yeah. it's a, a, safe, a usage safety net. Yes, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, there, there's a lot more that you, you could unpack about the, the visual mm -hmm. side. Yep. And, of course, there are going to be exceptions. Mm -hmm. sure. There are going to be some boys who are more into color and texture and descriptive words. Mm -hmm. And there will be some girls that are a little more like boys. But understanding the spectrum right. is helpful. Yep whoever you're teaching. So then, you know, another area is stress and, and pain. The, the stress is interesting because we tend to think that all people would respond to stress similarly. Mm. But especially in children who are not yet experienced in regulating their reaction to stress, you will notice sometimes a very different and uh, Sachs explained that it has to do with initial reaction activates either the sympathetic or parasympathetic nervous system. Hmm. The sympathetic nervous system is when you, um, you breathe in and your heartbeat increases, your blood flow can increase, your, your body temperature can increase, you're kind of ready to deal with whatever's coming. Uh, whereas the parasympathetic response is everything slows down. Mm -hmm. One we might call the fight or flight response. Mm -hmm. The other one you could call it the tend and befriend or the hide and disappear kind. Mm -hmm. And again, this is true not just for humans but for all mammals, mm -hmm. that the initial reaction to stress in males is the sympathetic nervous system. And the initial reaction in females is the parasympathetic. So, you know, I noticed this with my children, you know. When my son was upset, everyone knew it because he was jumping around and he might scream and he might hit the wall and he might... And you get really physically agitated. And then you would, like, try to negotiate with him and get him to calm down and mm -hmm. think through and whatever's, mm -hmm. you know, what's going on. Whereas uh, I noticed with the girls, when something would upset them, they would usually like hide or crawl under a blanket or curl up. Mm -hmm. And I found it harder to help them figure out what was bothering them mm -hmm. because they would kind of clam up. Mm -hmm. And so Sachs explained that it takes a, a higher threshold of stress to send females into that fight or flight response. Obviously, it happens, right? but it's a, a higher level. And uh, I've noticed this with 
even with drama like movies, most of the boys that I know and in my family, they like high intensity Mm -hmm. movies with Mm -hmm. fights and battle scenes and strong tension and music that, you know, is very gripping and and almost threatening. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the females, my wife, certainly some of my daughters, they just don't go for that. They would rather have something that's kind of calm, lots of dialogue, you know, a a little bit of suspense, but no music to make it worse than it is. (laughs) And I just thought, wow, that's so interesting because – that stresses them, that that high intensity audiovisual entertainment stresses them in different ways. And one is able to deal with it and the other one is just not happy. I think it was a woman who invented the fast forward button <laughs> <laughs> to be able to get through those scenes. <laughs> I, I was watching <laughs> An episode of Madam Secretary with my mm. wife, and there mm-hmm. is a very good show. Mm-hmm. And <clears throat> there's this, and what they have is usually two or three subplots going on at any one time. Sure. And there's this one subplot with this FBI agent infiltrating into a kind of a paramilitary extremist um, group. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so he can, you know, find out where the bomb is. And and so every time that scene would go. The music would shift, mm-hmm. the, the dark would come, and she'd be like, um, I'm going to take my vitamins now. You yep. keep watching, and yep. then when this part is over, tell me and I'll come yep, back. Exactly. Um, yep, yep. What? It's just a <laughs> – but anyway, so I think you know we can realize that education, teaching, learning can be stressful yes. for everyone involved, yes. for the teachers, for the students. And if we understand that there's a different uh, relation to that, Sachs talks a lot about competition Mm, mm -hmm. and how males and females respond differently to competition. Mm -hmm. One aspect that I found very interesting, and I've seen this to be true, is boys do really well when they compete against each other or even fight. Mm -hmm. Like if two boys have a fight – they will very often end as friends, mm. right? Because they will have established their hierarchy. Everything will be in place. They've got their energy out, and now there's a, a mutual respect that can happen. Whereas girls do not like to fight. They, they don't often don't like to compete against their friends. They, they might prefer to be on a team with their friends and lose – than to be on a team against their friends Mm -hmm. and win. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, Sachs went into quite a lot of detail about how you you can use this beneficially to create appropriate types of competition in the, you know, in a classroom environment. And he worked with schools all over the world uh, that were uh, experimenting with all boy classrooms and mm-hmm. all girl classrooms yep. and found that you know in most cases teachers were happier students were happier learning test scores mm-hmm. improving mm-hmm. and uh, you know it became a, a tough thing for him and and he kind of had to move into a different area of of helping people sure um, because that just became very unpopular. Right. And yet the the empirical evidence is that it was really good yep. in most all cases. Yep. So, and then, you know, uh, pain. Um, boys and girls, males and females respond very differently to pain. Mm-hmm. Boys, you know, will hurt each other and hurt themselves on purpose because it feels good. <laughs> and most girls just don't go there. They no. do not appreciate the feeling of pain in mm-hmm. that same way. So mm-hmm. understanding that helps you, you know, build bridges. Mm-hmm. And, you know, if it's a, a family discipline appropriately, 
in a classroom understanding and and that it's connected with temperature mm. as well. Mm -hmm. uh, boys do better in cooler temperatures. Girls do better in warmer temperatures. It's the biggest fight in any household I know is about the thermostat <laughs> between the sons and the mom or the brothers and the sisters. So there's so much there. And, you know, I, I have recommended Dr. Sachs's books. Um, there's Why Gender Matters. I think the first edition actually was more useful in many ways than the second edition. So if you can get an old one, Boys Adrift, Girls on the Edge, The Collapse of Parenting, you know, I recommend them all with a caveat mm -hmm. in that I don't agree with everything in those books. I mean, right. I don't agree with everything in almost every book I read. I mm -hmm. don't agree with everything, but that doesn't mean there isn't value. And like I said, the thing about uh, the people in this area who are doing the research, they are trying to be very objective mm -hmm. scientists. Yep. And you know, I appreciate that. I mean, there's people who don't like the science, but that doesn't mean there isn't the research to support it. The The more recent book I read that maybe would be worth a conversation at some point is The Boy Crisis mm. by Warren Farrell and John Gray. And this is more about how we are treating boys and girls differently in the world today and how that's really a great disservice to many, many boys rather than Sachs's research mm -hmm. that I found so interesting many years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and, you know, there are other books, Bringing Up Boys by James Dobson. I mm -hmm. mean, if you go look for it, there's dozens of books right. about teaching boys and teaching girls and doing it better. And they may not be the most popular because the world wants to kind of deny I mean, in some places that there's even such a thing as boys and girls, but the science, the research, the experience can be valuable for us as teachers and parents. Right. Well, as teachers and parents, Andrew, thank you again for bringing such relevant content to this podcast. Always a pleasure. Thanks so much for joining us. If you enjoyed this episode and want to hear more, please subscribe to our podcast in iTunes, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, or Spotify. Or just visit us each week at IEW.com slash podcasts. Here you can also find show notes and relevant links from today's broadcast. One last thing. Would you mind going to iTunes to rate and review our podcast? This really helps other smart, caring listeners like you find us. Thanks so much.